Welcome, my name is Dr. Stephen Sennett. I'm an osteopathic medical physician from the United States. I'm going to give you a two-part lecture today. This is part one, history and theory of osteopathy in the cranial field. Uh, many of you may know it as craniosacral therapy or by other names. Uh, I've chosen to put just a few photos here. We could actually put very many of people that have been influential in the osteopathic medical world and outside the osteopathic medical world. This is Dr. Sutherland. He's credited with developing osteopathy in the cranial field. Uh, this is um, this is Dr. Weaver. She very rarely gets uh, the credit that she deserves. Dr. Weaver and Dr. Sutherland were both developing their own cranial theories. They were not working uh, together. They were working separately. Um, in, uh, but what we know in most of the world and the popular offshoots of cranial in the modern world comes from this man, Dr. William Garner Sutherland. I chose also to put up here um, Dr. Fulford, um, who was helped propagate the membranous model and did many, many other types of things in the osteopathic medical world, it, developments in energetic med medicine and so forth. Um, Dr. Upledger, Dr. Upledger is probably the most um, popular name known around the world for craniosacral therapy. He was an osteopathic medical physician. And me personally, I knew John quite well. I credit him with really raising awareness around the world for this idea of cranial treatment. Um, this is by far one of the greatest things he's done is raise awareness. Um, Beryl Arbuckle, she did a lot of work in the 40s and 50s and 60s with children with cerebral, uh, spine, um, cerebral palsy. And Viola Fryman, she is the last one to die in this group uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, she had done quite a lot for children and uh, a lot of charity and helped to develop a lot of ideas within um, cranial manipulation. But again, to be clear, you could put many, many other faces up here, but these are some very world-changing people. Dr. Sutherland observed five phenomena that led him to this idea of osteopathy in the cranial field. This didn't come from, uh, from Dr. Still. Um, the story is that Dr. Sutherland went to Dr. Still and he showed him the temporal bone and said that it looked like the gills of a fish and that maybe there was something like respiration happening, happening there. The story goes that Dr. Still said, go and find out about that or quote unquote, dig on. So this didn't come from Dr. Still. This is, a, this is an offshoot that Dr. Sutherland went on his own. So phenomena are we observe something, something happens, and then we try to explain how it happens. And, and I'm, we're gonna explain that with several different theories. So the phenomena that he observed that he wanted to explain with cranial theory was these five things. Number one, that there's an inherent motility of the brain and spinal cord. Motility means something within the brain, within the cord itself was causing it to move. It wasn't moving secondary to something else, such as respiration or pulse. It had its own movement. The second observation was that there was a fluctuation in the cerebral spinal fluid, that it wasn't just static. There were times when it was being produced and times when it was being, being reabsorbed. There's a mobility of the intracranial and intraspinal membranes. To differentiate the words mobility and motility. Mobility means we can move them. They are not fixed in place. They have attachments, but they are immovable. The fourth one was that there is an articular mobility of the cranial bones, that they have the ability to move. They are not fused. And the last one is that there's an involuntary mobility of the sacrum between the ilia. So we know the sacrum uh, moves um, during the gait cycle and during and other ways to induce, induce motion, but that there was some other motion that was happening involuntarily. Uh, and he wanted to find out why is this happening? This was the underpinning of his research in the cranial field. Dr. Sutherland named this uh, motion that was impelling this cranial motion, the primary respiratory mechanism. He called it primary because he believed this was the first to, to uh, appear in life and the last to depart in death. Um, as a rhythm, we can describe it with qualities of rate and amplitude. Another feature 
uh, for, for this is that there is something called a still point. Still point doesn't refer to Andrew Taylor still. Still point refers to when the mechanism of its own accord or by induction stops for an inde indeterminate period of time. Body rhythms. There are rhythms that we use in medicine that um, are, are um, quite common today. We consider a cardiac rhythm. We consider a respiratory rhythm. In the manipulation world, there will be those that will have conjecture as to whether or not a cranial rhythm does or doesn't exist, whether visceral rhythm does or doesn't exist. For those of us who are doing manipulation, the cranial cycle, um, depending on who you might read, is between eight to 14 cycles per minute. The visceral rhythm is moving a little bit slower, six to eight cycles per minute. That motion, the cranial motion, which is theorized, uh, I don't know that to the date that I'm giving you this, that it has actually been reproduced um, in a proper laboratory situation. I've seen a number of anecdotal things and poor laboratory uh, reports, but I may be wrong about that. The cranial rhythm is thought to go through a motion that is less than 500 microns, which would be less than one half of one millimeter in excursion. So this chart here is just arbitrary. It's just something I made um, as a representation. It's not meant to be accurate or necessarily um, to scale. What I did here was I made this black one here, a very fast cardiac rhythm that we don't dispute in medicine. We can all palpate something like this. I made this blue one something that is slower and I'm calling that the respiratory rhythm. I made an even slower one, this red line, calling it cranial rhythm and a slower one I'm calling visceral. My intent with this diagram is to show that all of these things are happening all at the same time. So when you're trying to palpate these rhythms, you are palpating rhythms in an area where pulse is going through. Pulse is a whole body mechanism. Respiration is a whole body mechanism. Visceral is a localized me mechanism according to popular theories today. And cranial is a whole body mechanism. Um, so I've, I've already started to restate that from the previous slide, but when we compare things locally and globally, um, cardiac respiratory cranial rhythms, these are global in nature, meaning the heart squeezes and then a pulse can be palpated in the radial pulse, it can be palpated in the dorsalis pedis, it can be palpated everywhere through the body from the action of the heart. In the respiratory rhythm, we take in uh, a deep breath, our paired bones externally rotate, uh, our single bones go through flexion, and you can see the changes in the, in the entire body from taking in a breath. Cranial rhythm is such a rhythm. It is a global rhythm. Visceral rhythm is particular to the particular organ and not global in nature. Again, according to current popular theories. Um, theories within cranial. There's four popular models, and then there may be other uh, other offshoots from these models, but four popular theories. Um, the first is the osseous model. This is what Dr. Sutherland and also Dr. Weaver thought, that there was some motion happening and the cause of that, if I compare the heart for the cardiac rhythm and I say, what is the heart for the cranial rhythm? They felt that it was happening in the cranial bones. So it was a bony model. Dr. Fulford, his model said, no, no, I don't think it's happening in the bones. I think this is happening in the membranes, specifically in the dura. But he felt that that's where the magic was happening. Dr. Upledger said, no, this is a uh, closed pressure stat model. And what's happening is CSF is being produced and being reabsorbed. And that's why we're feeling a rhythm. Later on, um, Dr. Sutherland was introduced to Drs. Blechschmidt and Gasser. Um, Drs. Blechschmidt and Gasser were PhDs. They were not osteopath, osteopaths. They developed a different way of looking at embryology. Uh, their biodynamic way of looking at how the body developed embryologically. And their ideas combined with Dr. Sutherland and gave them a different model of what they felt the motion was. And that the motion was in, in essentially an embryologic echo of uh, what happened during embryogenesis. That is the biodynamic model. And that's a very, very, very popular model today. Um, this is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, in my experience, and I've done cranial study with many different people and 
with very different models, different egos, different ideas. Each of these theories seems to explain something that it seems to be useful for us. And each of these theories has flaws. You can poke holes in them. My experience is that people tend to study cranial and they become, uh, they become allied with a certain way of thinking and it becomes almost like a, a team sport. Uh, for myself, I've never viewed it that way. If the models don't seem to explain something correctly, we're still able to use the treatments but perhaps our thinking might be wrong or the thinking might be changed later on. So I have this little cartoon here where he says, I think you should be more explicit in what happens here in step two. And that's a, that explains a lot of cranial. This has not been, in my opinion, has not been scientifically proven where this is uh, by any means conclusive. So there is a phenomena, there's things that we observe and we make treatments based on phenomena and our observations and patients uh, many times are getting better from, from difficult situations. But perhaps the theories are still developing, perhaps some are right, perhaps some are wrong. So I'm not asking you to believe what I'm saying. What I'm asking, what I'm presenting to you is something for you to understand what people who do craniosacral manipulation, uh, cranial manipulation, osteopathy, cranial people, what do these people think? That's what I'm trying to clarify. So, on the general anatomy, in basic cranial, we're talking about the bones that make up the vault. The vault is the room that holds the brain. So you have the frontal bone, parietal bone, occipital bone, temporal bone, and the sphenoid bone. These, these five, um, two of them paired and several of them single bones, they house the brain. These bones are formed in membrane, whereas other bones are formed in cartilage. And Dr. Sutherland felt that because they're formed in membrane, it gives them more pliability. And this supports the theory that some motion was happening there. Um, you will note that the sutures, the cranial sutures, are interdigitated, which is like fingers coming together. There's something specific happening here. We'll also note that there are various impressions inside the skull due to the contents, the arteries, um, and other things that may be happening with inside the skull. Uh, a further look here will show us um, within the skull, we'll see ridges in certain places. Where there are ridges, there are going to be attachments of dura. There are gonna be, this is the petrous ridge here. Um, uh, this is the uh, lesser wing of the sphenoid. And wherever you see these ridges, Christogaly, um, uh, this is the transverse sinus and opistion. Wherever you see ridges, there's going to be a tissue attached there called dura. Uh, we can see arachnoid granulations here, which is where at least part, about 50% of the CSF cerebral spinal fluid is reabsorbed. We can note uh, different foramina um, where different uh, vascular and neural structures are exiting the cranial bones. And these all become important in uh, a more closer inspection of cranial study. Let's first discuss the osseous model. The bony model, we can clearly see uh, these, suit, these um, interdigitations where the sutures are coming together. And there seems to be a specificity to it. In other words, in each person, these will look individual like a fingerprint. They're not gonna be all wiggled the same way. So perhaps something is developing or moving in this way. Uh, we also will notice along the way things that are called, they're really artifactual, called Wormian bones. These little guys here, uh, this little piece here were probably pieces that broke off um, and they're not floating per se, but they don't change our overall cranial theory. Uh, these little bones that were part of another bone. As we start to look uh, closer on closer inspection, one of our osteotic principles is form and function. That if things are formed a certain way, there's probably an optimal function that is supposed to happen there. So as we look closer and closer, um, what we see is specificity. Um, the specificity is most likely due to Wolf's law, meaning the pressures that are put upon it. So, so that there, are, there is some genetic message saying that we should have um, two parietal bones, an occipital bone and a frontal bone. There's some genetic message that we get created in this way. But then how the bones actually work with each other, there's a specificity as forces are applied to them. 
um, an even closer look at the interprietal suture. And this was an observation from John Upledger. He said, um, if you can tell here, this is flat and this is, these are finger-like projections. He felt that and he theorized that. This is again, making an observation then trying to explain that observation. He theorized that um, while the interdigitations are allowing some sort of movement to occur here, perhaps this acted as, an, as a buttress to limit absolute motion, that maybe we will have several layers um, to guide the motion properly. Another noteworthy feature is beveling. This is the uh, parietal bone, this is the temporal bone. This is also interdigitated, but not as finger-like projections. They're more like rough ridges. And then there's ridges that would meet it on the inside of the temporal bone. This is originally what Dr. Sutherland looked at that said he thought this reminded him of the gills of a fish and that some motion was happening here. If we look even closer, this is the interparietal suture here. Okay, this is stained such that this is collagen. Okay, this is a river of collagen here between the parietal bones. And what we see is we don't see bone fusing to bone. When that happens, that's a clinical condition called synostosis. Um, it's quite normal and it uh, leads to various pathologies. So what we see here is a dynamic living structure. What are these arrows pointing to? Well, this green arrow, this is an arterial. This is a venule. How do I know that? Because arteries have a thick uh, tunica muscularis, so they retain their round shape. Here's another arterial here. Um, whereas venules are going to collapse because they have a very thin tunica muscularis. Okay, they're gonna be very collapsible. So again, what I want you to understand from this slide is that this is a living dynamic area. This is not an area where bones are fused together. If we take an even closer look, now it becomes very obvious here in this, um, this collagen river, we can see it starting to invaginate into the parietal bone. We can see a venule, arterial, arterial, living structure. Here you can see invaginations into the bone of collagen tissue. Again, form and function. This is a single nerve fiber that's inserted in this picture into the Falk cerebri in the sagittal suture. So what is its purpose? I don't know what its purpose is, but it's there. Again, we don't seem to have any mistakes in our body. So there's a nerve fiber that must be sending some information for whatever is happening at this suture. That might not be necessary if this was in fact a fused structure. I go a little further under electron microscopy, we see a single nerve fiber riding on the, riding on the back of a Sharpie's fiber. Sharpie's fiber is a collagen fiber that is anchoring to the um, parietal bone. Again, what is its function? I don't know what its function is, except that it is giving neural information back based on tensions or things that are changing in a dynamic, changing, living area. I thank you for uh, listening to this lecture. This is the end of part one. I'm going to continue in part two with the rest of the cranial theory.